All right. If you didn't do this for homework, you should do it right now. Here's a, here is a DNA sequence. What you need to do is write, and it's the template strand of DNA. You should be able to write the mRNA sequence from this, and we, we will spend some time on it. Okay, so I'm going to give you two minutes. If you've already done it, I suggest you check it over with a partner or partners. Go. Ah, uh, there's three of them. UAA, UGA, or UAG. Or UAG. So, University of Anchorage, Alaska. Alaska Anchorage, UAA. University of Georgia. And there's some university in South America that has UAG as its I think it's like Guadalajara or something. between template DNA and the mRNA. Two features. 
Sarah. Okay, that's true. Three features. So uracil instead of thiamine. What else? Anti-parallel would be the term we'd use, but that works. So what we mean is 5 prime to 3 prime of 1, 5 to 3 in the opposite direction of the other. And those 5 to 3 are referring specifically to carbon molecules. We're not going to focus on anything more than that. Uh, so these are anti-parallel. What's the last feature? They pair up. They're complementary. A to U, T to A, G to C, right? So um, this is our template DNA. In other words, what that means is this is a template to make the mRNA. The other term that oftentimes gets used is non-template DNA. The non-template DNA looks identical in sequence to the mRNA. With one exception, T's in the DNA get replaced with U's. Okay, so a couple of things there. Um, what direction does RNA polymerase transcribe the mRNA? Five to three, Five to three with respect to what? Of the strand that's being made or the template? Uh, the strand that's being made. So in other words, as the RNA polymerase is moving, it's going to move left to right here. Uh, it reads the template in the 3 to 5 direction, making new RNA in the 5 to 3 direction. Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to kind of go through some of these features. I'm going to try to recap some of that stuff from the concept map that you created and, uh, and now also add an extra layer of things that are specific to prokaryotes as well. So that's what we're going to try to do today. Um, in reading this then, what is our start code on? And all we would do here is just scan this to find the first AUG. You don't have to start reading in triplicates from the start. Scan until you find that AUG. And that's exactly what a ribosome does. So ribosomes in eukaryotic world, or sorry, prokaryotic world, look for what's known, and I'm not holding you to know this, but they look for what's known as a Scheindel garno sequence. It's basically a short sequence of uh, mRNA nucleotides that come right before the first start or the first AUG that's going to be used as the start codon. Um, so our AUG here would be this one, and then we start reading in multiples of what? Three, and each three represents a. Well, amino acid, but what's the term we use for that triplicate? Codon. And each three corresponds to an amino acid. So from this AUG, we've got GUG, AGA, GGC, CUG, ACA, GCU, or C CGU, UGG, UAA, so on and so forth. Where is our stop codon? University of Alaska, Anchorage. Okay. So, um, am I asking you to memorize the codons, especially the start and stop? No, because I'll give you a table whenever you need it for the exam. But knowing at least the start and stop codons can make you a little bit more efficient with your time. So, one major start, st uh, start codon, which is the AUG, and then there are three stops. AUG, or I'm sorry, UAG, UGA, and UAA are the three major ones. What's our amino acid sequence then for this particular one? Anybody do this part? No? Yeah? So what's our amino acid sequence? And that's the first one. What's next? Uh, Val. Next? A pirate's favorite amino acid. Next? THR, threonine, arge, just because the pirate says arge. Huh? Dry? It's TRP, right? Tryptophan? Stop. You don't need to write stop, but I do just to make sure we know where we're at. Any questions on this basic flow of information? 
what binds to these codons? <coughs> anticodons. Found on what? What molecule has the anticodons? Not the mRNA, the tRNA, right. And so if you're thinking about this conceptually, the tRNA is bringing an amino acid that corresponds to these codons to the ribosome allow, and allows for that growing polypeptide chain to form. What binds to a, to a stop codon? What binds to UAA, UGA, or UAG? This is actually one of the terms. Not terminator, but termination factor. Termination factor. So the termination factor will bind to these stop codons, and when it does, the termination factor is kind of like a modified tRNA. In essence, when it binds, it uses GTP, separates those two subunits of the ribosome from each other, thereby stopping translation at that point. Okay. So that's how that process occurs. Okay. Um, let's see. Any other questions? We good with this? Kaylee. So it says the non coded channel. Is there a non coded channel? Ah, uh, yes. Um, the non. The coding strand is essentially the same thing as the mRNA sequence. So the relationship here is template is also known. By, some people will also call it the non-coding because it's not the one that gives you the mRNA code. That's why. The other term, non-template, can also be called the coding strand because this is the one that gives you the actual mRNA code. I'm going to stick to this terminology because I've gone back and forth before and it gets really confusing. So we will just stick to template, meaning the strand that the mRNA is made from, and the template and mRNA are anti-parallel and complementary. The non-template is identical to the mRNA sequence. Okay. <sighs> Any other questions on this part? Wait, so yeah. the non-template, it's like the exact same as the mRNA, RNA, or is it the anti? It's actually exactly the same as the mRNA sequence, but because because if this is our template DNA, DNA is always double stranded, right? Or at least let me let me pause. In chromosomal world, DNA is always double stranded, and so to a template strand, there also has to always has to be a complementary or non-template strand, right? So we're also saying that this mRNA is actually complementary to that template as well. So the mRNA and non-template would look the same, with the exception that these U's would be T's if we were talking about DNA. Any other questions? All right, next step. We are going to spend very, very little time talking about the actual process of replication. So what I'm going to do real quick is draw out a replication fork, label a few things, and you've got to describe what they are. So we've got heel case. An RNA primer. And I want to know which enzyme makes that. DNA polymerase. And then Two, three minutes. Describe the function of those three proteins and which is the which protein makes this RNA primer. We'll start there. Form between those base pairs. Okay. 
So helicase, there's going to be one at each of those replication forks as replication is occurring. Um, what's the role of DNA polymerase? It does add the nucleotides. What kind of nucleotides? Deoxyribonucleotides, not ribonucleotides. So DNA is making a copy of the DNA. Replication is the process that, that we're talking about here. Which, which enzyme creates this RNA primer? Primase. The question becomes why? And there's a couple of reasons. One, actually the reason why an RNA primer is needed is because DNA polymerase, there's, there's two things that DNA polymerase always needs. One, it needs a template to make new DNA from. It can't just start making strands of nucleic acids. So that is this strand here, that, parent, that mother strand is that template. The second thing that every single DNA polymerase needs is it needs a starting point. It can't start from no nucleotides. It needs a few for it to latch on to so that it can begin that process of polymerization. So this primer is here short term to allow for DNA polymerase to begin that polymerization process. It eventually gets removed. So in cases where, well, down here, for example, when you have these lagging strands, each one was begun with an RNA primer. There are two DNA polymerases. I'm not asking you to know them both. One of them does the vast majority of the replication. The other one will, as this process is occurring, remove this RNA primer and put in its place DNA. And so that's how these RNA primers get removed, is by that secondary DNA polymerase. Okay. Function of ligase? Sarah? And, and the leading strand as well. It pieces together all of these fragments that get formed. So the role of that ligase then is to hydrolyze the, uh, or to basically create a, sorry, not hydrolyze, that's not the right term, um, to perform a dehydration reaction, to bond together the sugar and the phosphates that make up the backbone of these individual strands of DNA. One enzyme's not in here. What's the function of gyrase? It's not, ne it's not necessarily unwinding, because that's the role of helicase. It's tangling. Yeah, tangling, uncoiling might be the word that we use. So one of the functions of gyrase is to actually prevent the DNA from undergoing supercoiling. Um, what do we... Oh, for goodness sakes. So the supercoiling would occur as those two replication forks are moving down towards the end. Gyrase is there to, un to release some of that tension. Gyrase has another role, and that role is to separate the two chromosomes once they've been replicated. So one of the issues here is that with bacterial chromosomes, they're circular. Once they have replicated, they form almost like a chain link. And for a cell to be able to undergo division, it has to be able to resolve those chain links from each other. That's the role of gyrase. So gyrase will cut both strands of one of these two fragments of DNA, separate them from each other, and then ligate the one that it's cut back together. That allows for binary fission to take place. Some antibiotics target this process, and what we actually find is in those cases, so if you were to treat E. coli, for example, with a chemical known as naledixic acid, this is a quinolone. Quinolones target, and fluoroquinolones target, which enzyme? Was an, this was not an exam question, but something you should have known for the exam because it was one of the antibiotics we talked about. I can. Quinolones target what enzyme? Gyrase. Gy, like a J. 
Okay. So normally E. coli are short, rod-shaped. Again, where is that DNA located? <coughs> Nucleoid in the cytoplasm. Good. When treated with nalodixic acid, if you look at E. coli that have been treated for, say, 45 minutes to an hour, the cells continue to grow, but you still get one nucleoid location. And the reason for that is because nalodixic acid doesn't actually inhibit the growth of these cells. We're continuing to synthesize peptidoglycan. It's because those two chromosomes won't separate from each other. And so the cell stalls in binary fission. It ends up making it through part of the process, but those two chromosomes aren't able to actually separate from each other. So, the, so nalodixic acid and some of these other quinolones, they're actually bacteriostatic. They inhibit these cells from growing any further past this point. All right, we'll come back to that later on as well. Um, one of the things that I want to spend a little bit of time on is talking about some of the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes when it comes to these processes. But first, any questions on this general process here? I'm not going into great depth because we really don't need, this is not a major focus of what we're talking about. Instead, the focus right now should be on two things. What's different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes? and then flow of genetic information, being able to take DNA sequence and then describe ultimately how does that affect structure and function of proteins. And that's something we'll continue on for the, uh, in a couple of days again. All right. So there are, are a couple of things that are different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes when it comes to uh, transcription and translation. In eukaryotes, where does transcription occur? Oh, does it? In eukaryotes, where does transcription occur? In eukaryotes, nucleus. In prokaryotes, cytoplasm. So there's a key difference there. And where does translation occur in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes? That's in the cytoplasm. So what this allows for then is a couple of unique situations. What we would say is that in terms of eukaryotic transcription and translation, they're actually spatially separated from one another. In other words, for translation to occur, the mRNA from a eukaryote actually has to be exported from the nucleus. Okay? And that takes some time. In prokaryotes, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, transcription and translation can occur on a single mRNA at the exact same time. Case in point is this example here. Okay. There's another thing that helps to dictate this, though. Um, eukaryotic mRNAs have exons and what else? What's the other term? They've got introns. And those introns, you may remember, those are the intervening sequences, is, is the long name. Those are, are parts of the mRNA that may have been required for the expression of the mRNA, but aren't necessary, they don't contain genetic information that's going to lead to the production of a protein. So those introns have to be cut out, and the mRNAs are processed or spliced together to create one long piece of mRNA or mature mRNA that contains just exon sequence and nothing else. Prokaryotes, no introns. Everything's exon. So we have one single exon in prokaryotic mRNAs. So because those two features, because there's no processing required and because transcription and translation occur at the exact same time, we can get what has been called in the past, oops, oh crud, uh, these Christmas tree structures where you have a single strand of DNA, and then off of that DNA you have mRNA being, or right, uh, sorry, RNA polymerase moving down, producing mRNAs, and on each of those mRNAs, as they're undergoing their transcription still, they can be translated at the exact same time. This allows for incredibly quick changes in gene expression. In bacterial cells, from turning on or expressing a gene to the time in which we can detect protein, five minutes. 
in eukaryotes, hour, two hours maybe, for those changes to take place. Um, so this is just showing that here, where this is our DNA. The mRNAs are moving in this direction, and so the length of them here correlates to how much mRNA has been made. And then these polysomes or multiple ribosomes on them are each producing the polypeptide at the exact same time. Okay? So that's a couple of differences there. The, the spatial separation and then the difference in the structure of the mRNA are two key features. Um, another one is actually this process here in transcription. The initiation of transcription isn't so much different, but it's actually what stops transcription that's different. Uh, typical structure of an mRNA in eukaryotes, or as you guys have learned them. What's the typical structure of an mRNA? What features does it have? If I were to draw something like this. That's, that's true. Anybody know what this is called? Abby? What? It's a poly A tail. It's a poly A tail, yeah. And oftentimes these have a 5' prime cap of some sort. And these are there in eukaryotes as a way to protect that mRNA from being basically destroyed or broken down. So it increases the lifespan of these mRNAs. Prokaryotes don't have either of those structures. The poly A tail is also important. It gets created during the process in which transcription is actually stopping. And in prokaryotes, stopping tra transcription is a little bit different. Um, bless you. So in prokaryotes, what we have are stem loop structures or termination sequences. And if this is my mRNA, here's the five prime end. What stem loop structures are, are basically mRNAs base pairing back on themselves. So we might have a short sequence like that, and then we get base pairing here. And these are palindromic sequences. These stem loop structures destabilize the RNA polymerase. Essentially, they kind of bump the RNA polymerase off of the DNA and stop transcription from occurring. Obviously, these stem loop structures or these termination sequences would have to occur somewhere downstream of where the start and the stop codon is located, so that full mRNA actually encodes for a protein. Um, but these structures end up stopping that process so that the RNA polymerase doesn't keep moving and transcribing past the sequence of that gene. So that's another key difference between Yes, yes, both of you. A stem loop structure or a hairpin loop structure would be the other name. So, so for those of you who have bobby pins, for example. Yep, that's an awful drawing. We can all admit it, so I'm just going to erase it. It's a bit inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, so that stops the process of transcription. Okay. Um, one, one thing that we haven't pointed out here that I do want to bring up real quick, uh, and so I, I apologize for backtracking, but DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase, there, there are some differences between them. One is, should be fairly obvious. What, what is one difference between DNA and RNA polymerase? What they make. DNA polymerase makes DNA involved in replication. RNA polymerase uses DNA as a template, makes RNA. It is involved in transcription. A couple of other key differences. I, I mentioned here that DNA polymerase requires a primer to begin uh, replication from. RNA polymerases don't. They can actually start from nothing. And we'll come back to this when we talk about transcription a little bit. 
but this allows for transcription to start as soon as the RNA polymerase sits on, uh, on the promoter of the gene. The other key difference here is that DNA polymerases have proofreading ability. What do we mean by that? So if we say a polymerase has proofreading ability, what might we mean, Sarah? Exactly. So DNA polymerase has the ability that if it makes an error, if it makes a mismatch in the sequence, it oftentimes will back up, remove the mismatched nucleotide, and then begin again in its process. And this reduces the, the, the frequency of mutations and increases what we call the fidelity of the, of the DNA polymerase. RNA polymerases don't have that proofreading ability. They often are quite error prone, making a mistake maybe every 10,000 base pairs. DNA polymerase is somewhere more on the order of about one every million or so. So it's quite rare. Okay, so let's go through a, a couple of things with transcription real quick. Um, obviously, process here is making RNA to, uh, complementary to a template <coughs> strand. Note that the RNA polymerase uh, here has kind of a, what we call a transcription bubble. Uh, RNA polymerase has some helicase activity to it. It actually can un, uh, unwind short fragments of the DNA, which allows it then to read one of those two strands as the template strand. Um, how does the RNA polymerase know where to go, though? So how does it know that an mRNA is where it's at right now? Or that's a sequence for an mRNA? Shall we play a game of Hangman? Let's. It's been too long. Have we done Hangman this semester? No. Holy crap, I am way behind. My apologies. I have deprived you guys of a good game of Hangman. You can guess it if you want. It is a promoter. No, you should. Promoter. So what's a promoter? Basically, a sequence of DNA where the RNA polymerase binds. How does, how does a prokaryotic ribosome know where the promoter is? How does it get there? It's that sigma thing. It's the sigma factor, which is, the, is kind of like a GPS subunit. All right? So what is the sigma factor? There are, in E. coli, there's probably seven or eight sigma factors. Each of them recognizes a slightly different sequence. And in particular, these sequences are located about 35 nucleotides and 10 nucleotides bef before what we call the, the transcriptional start site, which is this location right here. So it makes contact at those two locations and these sequences are specific for each of the different sigma factors. And each one will control the expression of anywhere from 2,000 genes to maybe 10 or 20 genes. Okay? So bacterial cells have, or E. coli, for example, have 5,000 genes. Not every single one of them is expressed at the exact same time. In most cases, it might only be 40% of the genes are expressed. And they're not all expressed to the same exact level. And that the expression can change based on the, on the conditions. So for example, take E. coli, it's a mesophile, non-halophile, non put it into some salt, it's going to change gene expression to deal with the presence of that salt. And so the way that it would do so is to switch which of these sigma factors or these GPS units it's using to localize it to new promoters so that it can turn on the expression of a different set of genes. And that's how most of these organisms deal with these situations. Um, the actual structure itself that performs the making of the mRNA is this large RNA polymerase. And the sigma factor, after bringing the, the polymerase there, basically just kind of falls off. The polymerase then performs the transcription process. 
We'll spend a little bit more time talking about this on Friday because we're going to talk about specifically the LAC operon and talking about how do environmental cues, um, particularly different types of sugars, control which genes are going to be expressed within bacterial cells. All right, anybody in here OCD? Sarah, no? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I, then I assume you like things organized? Yeah, okay. I am not the most organized person, but I can tell you that in my house, um, my socks, my shirts, my pants, my underwear are all in separate drawers. Okay? I'm sure that that's true for most people, right? Except for my son, Jake. That is definitely not true. All right? <laughs> point that I'm trying to make here is there's organization. We, we like to have things organized. And bacterial cells in their genomes, they are organized as well. They're organized oftentimes by similar function. So, for example, I keep all of my kitchen utensils, my spoons, my forks, my knives, in the exact same drawer. They are used for a similar purpose, right? I would not store them with, for example, the, the laundry detergent. That is for something else, right? Same, same process here. There are different operons. And operons, in essence, are a set of genes that are controlled under one promoter so that they all can be turned on or turned off, expressed or not expressed, at the exact same time within bacterial cells. So um, in this particular picture, let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, towards the top, so about 1.30, 2 o'clock, that's our lac operon, and that's the one that we'll focus on in a couple of days. There are four genes here. One of them is a regulator of the operon. The other three are expressed only in a subset of conditions, so only during special times when the environmental conditions are ripe for the expression to occur. All right. Where does, where does replication start in a bacterial cell? Where does replication start in a bacterial cell? The origin. And, and so the origin for E. coli is this OREC listed right here. Uh, this has a specific sequence that recruits initiators of replication, including the helicase, the polymerases. And so replication begins from that one spot and occurs in both directions from that. And usually where, trans where replication stops then is about eh, pretty much exactly 180 degrees on the other end, typically. All right. Um... Let me see if there's anything else I need to cover real quick. Nope, I think that's it. So, a um, couple of things to keep in mind from today then. Major points, one, things that are unique to prokaryotes when it comes to replication and transcription, okay? And these special features, for example, the ability to transcribe and translate at the same time are based on, in part, the spatial organization of these microorganisms. Because prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, those two events can occur at the exact same time. Second thing that I want you guys to keep in mind, because this is something we will come back to not only on Friday, but again on Monday and Wednesday, DNA to <coughs> RNA to amino acid sequence. What happens in the DNA, or the code that's in the DNA, will dictate the structure and function of proteins. And when we talk about, for example, mechanisms of resistance to antibiotics, mutations or changes in the DNA are one of those mechanisms. And so that's where we're going with this in the next couple of class periods. Uh, for homework, I need to make a quick change because I made a mistake. But basically, these are going to be group wikis. Each member of the group has to put together one column of the table. And the table is set up for you to analyze the lack of... Sorry, Rose. Rose. My bad. Rose. Rose this time. Thank you for saying that out loud. There are four rows, and that's what you should do. Um, 
I would suggest watching the mini lecture ahead of time because this is the LAC Operon. This is something that all, it does not fail every single semester, but half the class doesn't know what we're talking about when we get into class. So watch the mini lecture. This is a two-parter. In other words, part one is due at 12 o'clock tomorrow, 12 p.m. afternoon. Yes, 12 p.m so that you have an extra 12 hours to finish up the last part. The first part is to complete the table. The second part is for each member of the group to identify one trend they observe that comes across once that table is completed. It's due tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Huh? It's the same groups as you had for the second one, Emily. And I saw that face change real quickly. You're going from an angry look to a disappointed look as soon as I said same groups. <laughs> What's that? Uh, at least fill out three of the rows. One, one person, if you want to, can fill out the last one. All right. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy your time with John after in lab. No, that was saying that you're in the same groups, right? Oh, reviews. Yes, thank you for asking that. That is with groups that I just ran in the assignment. It's due actually Saturday night. And you don't even need to interact with the group members. I just assigned three or four people to work on it. To work on it, but it's a voice thread. You don't need to physically interact with the other people, other than just to share the file with them. Yep. Yeah.